Yeah. Well, you know about that, don't you, Michigan boy? You're like, well, that's no big deal. We we go out and live on the ice for a month and fish in a little hole about this big. Yeah, I know them little shanties. But uh, it's been a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Christmas. I hope y'all have enjoyed it. How many are glad it's over? Yes, we got some truthful people back here. That's good. That's good. Uh, that's wonderful. How many are excited that uh, this is the last Sunday of 2020? You know, it, 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 things don't magically change just because you flip a calendar over. But I'm here to tell you that the same God that flung the stars into the sky, who created those bodies, those heavenly bodies, those planets, and put the planets in motion, He's the one that set up the times and the seasons, and He's the one that appointed our earth to circle our sun, and it'd be a 365-day year. So there is something about time frames. And though it doesn't magically happen when you flip that calendar over to January 2021, but there is something that I believe if we will appropriate our faith to this next year, that it will change things and it can change things. And just like Kelvin was saying, it's time to see things change. It's time to move from that. And we've talked, we talked I, two years ago, maybe even longer, we, that, that the Lord inspired me to say moving from complacency to compassion. And Kelvin brought that to my remembrance this morning during prayer time. And Church, I'm telling you, and, and I know uh, I've talked with Kelvin and he shared some stuff and he's wanting to get involved in some community stuff like these council meetings. And I, the church, it is time for us to uh, so flex our muscle. How about that? The church is powerful. We've been given the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. There is power inside of us. And, 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 and not only in, as individuals, but think what we can do as a body of believers, a corporate body coming together, just like going out. And, and, and I want to remind you, too, next Sunday, and this is for everybody watching online, we're going to do our uh, prayer after uh, the service on Sunday. And the reason I'm bringing that up now is because that Jericho march that happened in D.C., well, we went down to the sheriff's office out there in front of their courtyard. That was prompted out of that prayer time uh, the first Sunday of, of last month. And let me tell you, that some people took notice. I, Steve and Shirley ran into somebody at Cracker Barrel and just started strike, striking up a conversation with them. And and uh, I guess they, I don't know how it went, but uh, the conversation went towards, yeah, we were the ones out there in front of the sheriff. Oh, because the, he was a sheriff or a deputy or worked in the sheriff's office. He says, yeah, we know who you are. These are the things that we've got to do as a church, going, reaching into our community, making our presence known. And that will change, start changing things. People, When people say, yeah, I know who you are. That's how it ought to be. They ought to know who the church is. And I'm not just talking CGC. I'm talking church universal. They ought to know who the church is in this earth. And for too long, we've just laid dormant. We've been uh, uh, just quiet and to ourselves and thinking our faith is enough for ourselves. But I'm telling you, such a time as this, we are coming into that time where the church is needing to arise, take its rightful position of authority, exert its muscle, flex its muscle in this earth. Why? Not so we can be lifted up on high. No, so we can gain souls into the kingdom of God before this time wraps up. And we're getting closer and closer, aren't we? So I want to remind you about that prayer time next Sunday after service and to be attentive to that, to come expecting because we believe we're spirit-led church. We believe that the spirit speaks to us and when he speaks, when we're obedient, just like we were that time, things start to happen. You believe that? All right. All right. Well, let's do it then. Let's do it. Let's not, just like Kelvin was saying, let's not, I think it was in prayer time, or let's not just, and maybe Robert brought it forth when he was, let's not just 
Talk about it. You got to talk about it. You got to start somewhere. And talking creates a, um, an urgency or stirs up people along the way. And you got to talk about it. But sometimes you got to put action to your words. You can't just be a hearer. You've got to be a doer. Amen. So we can talk about all these things, all these nice, wonderful things that we should be doing, could be doing, uh, ought to be doing, some we are doing. Uh, but at some point, you've got to you've got to put your foot out there. And step out in faith and do it. Whether it means going to council meetings or showing up at the uh, your your child's PTA meetings and and voicing your concern for some things that are happening, or you know, I mean, listen, I, and and I listen. I let me just confess right now. I was not a good PTA parent. I don't think I went to a single one of them. But I would have been probably the first to say when. They introduced some new book that I probably didn't agree with. I was probably the first to uh, say, well, why, why are they reading that stuff? You know, but did I go down and make? No. But now is the time we need to be doing that stuff. So learn from my mistakes. <laughs> you young people that may have kids coming up in school. Uh, this is where and, and, and man, I did not. This is just uh, this is of the Lord, I believe. Uh, this is, I believe, the education system is the uh, where the, the the enemy has wiggled his way in there to affect a generation, to change the mindset of a generation. And it's little by little, you know. I mean, it's like the frog in the pot, right? I mean, you know, it's little by little. He don't jump out of the pot because the heat rises <laughs> gradually, and he eventually gets cooked. And these things are happening so gradual over, over time that we haven't even seen it. But we got to wake up, church. We got to wake up. We got to wake up. Some of our, I mean, there's a whole generation that, uh, that, that the history of this great country, they're not even going to know it. I mean, the revisionists are always, already alive and well out there, but uh, they're just getting more and more bold about changing what the history of this country was about. <clears throat> and it ought not be so. And we, the church, as long as we are here in this earth, are to be the light of this world through Jesus and shedding light in a dark place. Amen? Well, glory to God. How many in here need faith for tomorrow? <laughs> I would say everybody needs faith for tomorrow, right? But we need to start today. We need to start today. It's just like saying, well, we need to do this. We need to do this as a church. I need to do this as an individual. I need, and not doing it. You know, you just talk about it. You talk about it. And, and so faith for tomorrow is kind of like that. But you need to start today. You need to have faith for today. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to read, uh, y'all know it, one of my favorite passages. One of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. And uh, I want to start in chapter 6, verse 24. <clears throat> and y'all know this well. You know it well. And uh, uh, let me just, yeah, let me start in 24. It's really 25 through, through 34 is the whole uh context of that but let me let me start in 24 it says no man can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will hold to the one and despise the other ye cannot serve god and mammon and that word mammon is just worldly riches you know earthly riches you cannot serve god and earthly riches Verse 25, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink or yet for the body, uh, what ye shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Take no thought. Listen to this. Take no thought for your life. Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much more than they? Listen, He will feed you. He will take care of you. Just like the Lord's Prayer says, He will provide for your daily need. 
Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe ye? O ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought. There it is again. Take no thought saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought. Three times he tells us for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Listen, we need to stop worrying about tomorrow. We need to stop worrying about what is coming in the future. We need to start considering today. Living in the present. Now, I'm not saying you can't plan ahead. You know, the Bible says to, to make a plan and God will direct your steps. But we can't worry about that plan. We can't worry about it. We can't have anxiety about it. You can't worry about what your kids are doing. I'm speaking to myself. You can't worry about what they're doing at all times, and day of the night. Train them up in the way they should go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from you. You've got to trust in what the word of the Lord says. And speak it forth. Sometimes we get so wrapped up in something that may or may not even happen that we lose sight of today. We lose sight of it. We've been wrapped up in this election. We've been wrapped up in, in COVID for almost a year now. How much of that has distracted us from seeking first the kingdom of God? Not saying those things aren't important and we shouldn't give them attention, but how many have replaced seeking first the kingdom of God with what is going on around us today? How many? Let's back up and look at John 15 again that I shared last week. And so that we do understand and know beyond the shadow of a doubt that we are to be the light in this world. But we cannot be the light without the light source, which is Jesus. We cannot be the light without the light source. You ever have a, a power outage at your house and you you know where the flashlight is and you go to grab it out of the drawer, that junk drawer that has about five million different things in it. And, you know, you cut your hand on the scissors that are in there and then you get tape and glue all over it from that and then glitter gets on your hand. And you finally find that flashlight in the pitch dark and you go to turn it on and guess what? The batteries are dead because you ain't used it in a year. So it ain't going to shine no light. Why? Because the light source, the batteries are dead. So you have to have the light source within you to be the light, to shine the light. Amen? John chapter 15. I don't know how far I'm going to read down here um, out of the Amplified. It says, I am the true vine. Who's, he, who's talking here? Jesus is. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Any branch in me that does not bear fruit, that stops bearing, he cuts away. Remember, we're the branches, right? Jesus is the vine. We are the branches. If we don't produce fruit, he's going to cut us away, trim off or take away. And he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit to make it bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. That's, from, that's going from faith to faith, from glory to glory, right? I mean, as you're a, 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 as being a believer producing fruit in your life, guess what? God's looking and saying, man, that's not enough fruit. Let me cut this piece off of them. Oh, look at that fruit. It's getting beautiful. Let me just trim this piece right here that's just... We are the branches. He is the vine. And then it goes on to say, without the vine, 
we can do nothing. Without the true source of light, we can't be a light. Without the vine, we can't produce fruit as a branch. Amen? He's the true vine, the true light. And apart from Him, we can do nothing. We must still let our light shine, trusting in God. And I think that's the key, especially for the day. We have to trust in God. Remember when He sent the disciples out and in that verse in Acts says, the Lord working with them. And I share that all the time because we like to take it on ourselves. We like to think, well, we have to do it in and of ourselves. We have to. We have to. I have to. I have to say. I have to do. I have to perform. I have to see results. No. It says the Lord working with them. All you got to do is make some effort. Start somewhere. Be bold. Strike up a conversation in Cracker Barrel. Go out and uh, uh, pray in the, in the common area of your uh, city. You just go out and do it. Make an effort and the Lord will work with us. Trusting in Him. To be bold. I'm telling you, it's time to get involved, church. I don't know, you know, I don't know if, if, if the Holy Spirit's moving on your heart as He is mine and obviously Kelvin and Teresa's, but uh, uh, we've got to get involved. We've got to be out there in our community. Whatever way that looks like, it can be, it'll be different for every person in here, I'm sure. Just because He wants to go sit in one of them eight-hour council meetings doesn't mean you have to, but there's another area somewhere where you can make a difference where you can share and be a witness and change things in this earth, standing in our place of authority as the church, moving from complacency. We've been complacent. The church has been complacent. And I've seen it in my own life, and I've seen it in the life of the church. There's not much compassion for even fellow believers anymore. Man, when I got born again and... And uh, uh, when we moved, we moved away to Richmond not too long after that and uh, found a church there. And I, today reminded me of, of that church again. We were meeting, I think I've told y'all in this, this old rundown barn. I mean, it was a barn. I mean, it was a true barn. I mean, like, like the barn you see on the side of the road driving through Floyd somewhere. It was a barn, old barn. And we met in that old barn. And we just saw it there, and we saw the cross on the front. And we were looking for a church, just had moved there. And we were like, we like, I like different, you know. I, I mean, I'm just, I don't like to, I, I can't, I, I can't live in a cookie cutter neighborhood. I'm, I'm not cutting on anyone, Denny, for doing that, but I'm just playing there. He's, he's got a beautiful house. I was just there the other day. Got a, got a plug there. I, I'm sorry. There are people that love that, and I just don't. I got to be different. Now, what that does for me is it hurts me when it comes to resell my property because usually I got some unique property that you can't sell. But anyways, what does that have to do with this? What was I saying? Barn. Thank you. Barn. We went in a barn. And uh, the first service that we went to in that barn, it snowed that morning. And it was just... I mean, y'all, just like this snow was just pure and pristine. And this little barn was on a, a farm which had acreage all around, a pasture all around. It was just white as far as you could see. And I remember, you know, we had just moved there and Caleb had just been born. He was less than a year old. And uh, we brought Caleb with us and trudging through the snow. It, it won't plow, okay? It was a barn in the middle of a field. We're trudging through the snow carrying our little... What do you call those infant carrier things? He's in it. And uh, we get in there, and uh, there's probably 45, maybe about the same size we are here, maybe a little bit less. And uh, I remember they were doing the worship. They were, they were, they were, they were praising God. <clears throat> and this, this one man, Bob Nillette, I remember, I'll never forget it. He's probably as tall as you, Gene. That's why I remember him so well. And he walked up to us and we're just, you know, we're praising God. And he said, you know, you see the snow out there? You see how pristine and white it is? You know, the word says that he will wash you 
just as white as that snow. And, you know, we were, they were, we were dealing with some things, you know, young couple, young marriage, brand new baby. And that just ministered to me. It ministered to me. And this snow just reminded me of that. But, uh, and I was going somewhere else with that, but um, the barn and the snow, washing me whiter than snow, encouraging me. I'm trying to give y'all clues so you like key in here. <laughs> The blood washing, washing us white. Oh my Lord, help me! I know y'all are saying good clues too. Being compassionate, that compassion that He showed us. Yes, that's it. So this church, this young uh, church meeting in this barn, there was such compassion among the individuals of that church and. We were always doing something for someone else or helping someone in, in a certain area or moving people or uh, eating and breaking bread together all the time, all the time. And I miss that. I miss that. I know, you know, church culture changes throughout uh, the, the years and the ages. And, um, you know, we don't do church like they did 300, 400, 1,000 years ago. I understand that. You know, uh, our dress changes, our style of music changes. Uh, but what shouldn't change is our compassion, our love for one another. The word never changes. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His word never changes. The delivery of it may change. The using uh, projectors and, and, and amplifying the, the music and, and the instruments, they may change. But the Word of God never changes. The message never changes. And another thing that should never change is our love for one another. Our love for one another. Now, the way we show it may change. I mean, you know, back in the day, you might have gone and helped someone build a barn. Well, there ain't too many people building barns these days. But, you know, uh, people move, helping people move, uh, taking furniture away, or breaking bread together. I'm telling you, there is something about breaking bread together. One of my favorite things is Fifth Sundays, where we can all just gather out in a gathering place and have a meal together. And uh, I, I wish it was... I, I just envision doing something more with that this coming year. I, I envision... You know, I know they're talking about... Um, and I think it got approved putting a park in here at Christiansburg. Uh, but that kind of atmosphere we, where we can go outside or... Uh, and, and do things. And, and man, be a, we have gotten to where we're, in, we're such a hurried culture. We got to do everything quickly. Even we got to eat quickly. I mean, if, when I grew up, if I didn't eat quickly, my two older brothers wouldn't leave me nothing on the table. So I had to eat quick. I learned that. But we are. We try to do everything too quick. I'm, look, I'm longing. I'm hoping, it is my prayer, that on these fifth Sundays and maybe even more frequent, that we could spend the day together as a body. Where we got stuff for the kids to do out there and they don't get bored in 10 minutes. They stay off of their devices more than 10 minutes. Where we can just come and eat and fellowship and talk with one another. Learn about each other's lives and what's going on in their life. I mean, you, we go out there and it's great to eat, but, you know, I mean, there's only so much you can share over a 30-minute meal because everybody's putting it in their mouth. But when you spend a half a day together and you just relax and sit down and, you know, some of the, the, the best time I've had is that when we had the picnic every year. And that's just once a year. We ought to be doing it. But I remember the very first picnic we had, I remember sitting down with Charlene Travis and we played that goofy game, what is it, Bananarama or something. Banana in a bag. I don't know what it's called. Bananagrams. Bananagrams. We played that. Fun. But we had to be, we were laughing and carrying on and just talking about different things and, and uh, or fellowshipping in people's houses. I mean, how much fun have we had over that silly marble game that y'all had? And I say silly, but I mean, it's just a game. I mean, I mean, we've seen some tension. 
Okay, don't play with Kelvin if he's losing. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's a good sport. <clears throat> but uh, just stuff like that, you know, I don't. I'd love to see that stuff just make a, a comeback, I mean, if you will. I, I think we've gone, gotten away from that. And that's, I think that's part of that complacency that we've gotten into. Well, it's, you know, Sunday mornings is enough for me, and I'll maybe, you know, watch some on TV. I'll read when I can, but, but where's the fellowship? Where's the love for one another? I don't know, you know? I just love to see that again happening in our church. And let us be an example to other churches. Amen. Listen, we got to remember this. That everything you see around you with your natural eye, it's temporary. It's temporary. Our government is temporary. COVID is temporary. Your life here in this earth is temporary. It's all temporary. Whether it's death or loss of a job or relationship issues or sickness or government or COVID or quarantine, it is temporary. Remember I said a couple of weeks ago we have to have an uh, uh, eternal view. An eternal view. But we live in this temporary. So how do we live in this temporary when times of trouble come against us? Well, it says, the word says, a strong spirit of a man will sustain him in times of trouble. I think we're seeing some times of trouble. And in bodily pain, the strong spirit of a man well, one, we must continue to feed our spirit, man, on the Word of God. Continually, continually feeding your spirit, man, on the Word of God. That's the first thing you can do. Two, I believe we must continue to gather together. I, the Bible says to, do not forsake the assembling together of yourselves. We must we must, let me say it, we must continue to gather together. You can watch all the religion you want on TV or social media, but it will never replace relationship. It won't replace relationship. I think it's an excellent tool. We, we're broadcasting right now on Facebook. It's an excellent tool. And I know that there are some that can't get out. And it's a great tool for them, but it cannot. Replace us gathering together. It cannot replace and will never replace relationship. It may help you understand the, the, the Lord's Word. It may help you to go deeper with some things in God. It's a tool. It's a tool. But it's not replacement. This, what we are doing right now, is just one part of it. What we do out in that gathering place and have a meal together, that's another part. When we come over to someone's house and have a meal or play a game and fellowship, that's another part of it. When you hijack someone and they ride around in the car with you all day long <laughs> delivering stuff, that's another part of it. That's all part of it. It's all part of being the body of Christ. <clears throat> but we're created for so much more. We're created for fellowship. I mean, that's why God created Adam in the beginning. He wanted to walk with Adam in the cool of the garden and talk and fellowship with him. And then that's why he created Eve, because he wanted Adam not to be alone. He wanted to have uh, Adam have someone there with him, a companion for companionship, for fellowship. That's why he created Eve. I don't think that Until this time, I don't think that I truly have understood how important fellowship is. This time where we've been in lockdown or quarantined or, you know, kept away or uh, from one another. I truly have not understood until now how critical and key, especially, especially 
to the body of Christ. How important fellowship is in showing our love for one another. That's why He created Eve. God created marriage. He created that to provide that companionship, that encouragement. Now some were called to be as Paul, set apart for the ministry. Don't you say under your breath beside yourself, I wish you'd have set me apart from my ministry. Some are encouraged by friends. Some have to encourage themselves just as David did. But God, He is always at the ready to be your standby, to be your encourager, to be your helper, to be your advocate, to intercede on your behalf. Listen, He has already provided everything that you have need of through the knowledge of Himself. And that gets us back to the first part. Getting, feeding our spirit man on His Word. Y'all understand you are a spirit, right? You are a spirit. You live in this fleshly body. You have a soul. We need to feed our spirit man, which in turn feeds our soul, renews our mind through the knowledge of himself. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 3. I'm just going to read that one verse. You don't have to turn there. It just says, For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness. He has bestowed upon us all things, all things, to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of Him who called us by and to His own glory and excellence or virtue. Through the knowledge of Him. How do you gain knowledge of Him? Right here. Right here. Just renew your mind. Renew your mind to the knowledge of God. It's right here. Right here in front of you. Right there in front of you. Just... (laughs) Robert, was it you in prayer? said, that thing could be sitting on your coffee table for 15 years, but you got to pick it up. You got to read it. You don't learn as much as uh, culture wants to tell you through osmosis. That word doesn't go into that inanimate coffee table and then if you put your feet up on it, it travels through your feet and up into your brain. It don't happen like that. You've got to actually pick up that Bible, that document. It's been written down for us, inspired by God. And we've got to read it. And not just read it, but meditate on it. Consider it. Chew on it. I don't care if you read one verse. I don't care if you read three words in a day. But if you meditate on that word, chew on it, consider it. Man, I'm telling you, it's powerful. Renewing our mind. Romans 12, 2, you don't have to turn there, says this, Do not be conformed to this world or this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial, remember it's temporary, customs. I, we just witnessed a, a custom of this world in this holiday we call Christmas. And, you know, I, I, I encourage us every year, don't get caught up in all the commerciality. Commercial? Commerciality? No, maybe. It's my word. Commerciality of it. Don't get caught up in that. You know, I try to encourage you every year. Don't load up the credit card with gifts for the grandchildren and the children and the, all your family and you got to buy for, you know, cousin Susie's second time removed. And I mean, we get caught up in that. That is a custom of the world. And I said, listen, remember, I, I clear, all that's good and well, but as long as you keep your priority, your priority. <clears throat> But it says, do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after, adapted to its external, superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, 
by its new ideals and its new attitude so that you may prove. Who? You may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Did it say that the pastor may tell me what it is? That the apostle may decree what it is? That the prophet may tell me what it is? The evangelist encourage me in what it is? No, he says, you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. For you. Ephesians 4.11 talks about it. You know, uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. Why has he placed us in this earth? The perfecting of the saints. Who are the saints? You are. And for what? Why are we perfecting you? To equip you for the work of the ministry. I am not here to lecture you. I am not here to hold your hand. I am here to equip you so that you can prove these things for yourself. God has already done it. He's already provided it. That very same power that rose Christ from the dead lives in each one of us. But you must prove it. How? By your faith. Your faith in His Word through your knowledge of His Word. How are you going to get the knowledge? you got to spend time in His Word. Listen, it takes effort. I wish I could tell you that as soon as I made that decision to follow Christ, that everything just became beautiful. Heaven opened up before me. The birds started singing. The flowers started blooming. Everybody in my life was pleasant and kind and full of joy. It didn't happen. It doesn't happen that way. There is an effort that we must make as a Christian. We must put the effort in. It takes time. You have to unplug from this world and assert yourself to learn it. It takes effort to stand against some things that come. It takes some effort to stand your ground. And sometimes it's hard and sometimes we fail and sometimes we fall. But I like what Pastor Rob says. Falling is not failing and failing is not final. You pick yourself back up again and you continue to stand your ground no matter what comes your way. I think... This part of this complacency that we're talking about comes from expecting others to do what we should be doing for ourselves. Did y'all hear that? Expecting others to do what we should be doing ourselves, relying too much on the pastor, apostle, prophet, evangelist, teacher, elder, spiritually strong that in our eyes, relying too much on them and not proving it for ourselves. Everyone's waiting around for prophets to tell them what to do, what's happening, what's going to come. Let me tell you, you have... God has placed those gifts in the body. And we receive them. We acknowledge them. But you have the same access to the Word of God. You can hear from God just like anyone else. If you have a relationship with Him through His Son Jesus, you can hear from on high. 
You can find out what's going on. You can prove it for yourself. You can find out what the will of the Lord is for your life. You don't... I want to be careful. I'm not saying that you can't, that you shouldn't listen to... I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that you can prove it for yourself by spending time in His Word, in fellowship with Him through prayer. Because He's already done it. It's all laid out. Hmm. You just need to mine the Word. And I say mine like mine, like digging, like digging for gold. Mine the Word of God to find out what the will of God is. And then line up your thoughts, your speech, to what His will is. And that is when things happen. That is when mountains are moved. When you find out what His will is, and then you align your mouth, you align your thoughts with that will of God, and that mountain will be removed. <clears throat> you want faith for tomorrow? Then start today. Start today. Start today. You know, we can't cheat death, but we can defeat it. We can't cheat it, but we can defeat it. How do we do that? The word says, Death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Let me put it this way, I, and, and this is going to be a bold statement, and this may offend some in here. But I have to say, if you're afraid of dying, then you're not in faith. If you are afraid of dying, then you are not in faith. How can I say that? Let me put it this way. If the doctor tells you there's nothing more he can do for you and you're going to die, then you ought to start rejoicing. Why? Because you're either going to be face to face with Jesus pretty soon or you're going to get healed and have a tremendous testimony and you're going to kick that devil right in the face. So either way you win. You're either going to be with your Lord and Savior Jesus. Or you're going to be healed and have a wonderful testimony that is going to set people free. So if you're afraid of dying, then you're not in faith. But there's an easy remedy for that. Get in His Word. Be built up on your most holy faith through His Word, through the knowledge of Him, so that you may prove it for yourself. That's why I love that Matthew 6 passage so much. It's a reminder to me, a continual reminder to me to not be anxious, to not get worked up about stuff going on in your life, I, listen, we have to. That's how we renew our mind. It's a continual thing. When I read Matthew chapter six for the first time, did did all my anxiety vanish? No, no. I still get anxious about things, but I got to bring myself back, ground myself back in the Word of God. So that I can overcome. That anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry about anything. That is not saying don't give it attention when you need to give it attention. That's not saying ignore it. That's not saying slide it under a rug and forget about it. But address it with the Word of God. What does the Word of God say about it? What is the will of God in that situation? Don't be fearful of dying.
I'm reminded of a, and I'll close with this. Because I want to pay tribute to someone that impacted my life. A gentleman named of Tom Struzeri. Had a wife, four daughters. Had, has a wife and four daughters. I went home to be with the Lord last week. But he was a mentor to Nikki and I both, him and Michelle, his wife. But I can tell you, I can stand here and tell you with a surety that he was not fearful of dying. He knows where he is. And the reason I can tell you that, because I see the comments that his four daughters make about him celebrating his life being assured that they'll see him again and that he's joyful and happy and healed and set free and face to face with his Lord and Savior. But he impacted my life. He impacted our life. And we weren't with them long. This was down in Richmond when we had moved there and went to that little barn of a church, met them, spent time in their house. We would sit around. We would get in the floor. It was just a small, I think it was maybe six of us that would come. And we would get in the floor and he would just share the Word of God and, and it was we asked questions. and It was just a precious time. It reminded me of the, when Mary was just at the feet of Jesus, just listening, soaking it in. And we would do that. And he had such a way of teaching the Word of God and it impacted me so much that I see myself doing the same things, that, not just glazing over the Word, but being very, um, I don't want critical, but technical about it, if you will. Just breaking it apart, you know, verse by verse, word by word, and seeing the words just jump off the page and, he had such a way of teaching that it really impacted me. It increased my faith tremendously. In fact, the short time we were there, I think we were in Richmond five years, four and a half years. And, uh, you know, we met them maybe a year after we had moved there or so, uh, or not met them, but started to fellowship with them. And, but uh, so even if it was for a year, maybe that, that we hung out, it impacted my life. I don't doubt that I'm standing right here as part of uh, his, his legacy, his teaching, his mentoring us. But I can tell you, and if you would read the comments that his daughters have placed on social media, he was a man of faith, a man of God, not fearful of dying. Nor should you be. Don't let that fear of death steal your life. Don't let it take life from you. Don't let it keep you in timidity and cowardness and not being bold for the things of God. I'd, I've said, I'd rather die in faith than live in fear. Are y'all hearing me? So it's time that we stop being so timid about who we are and whom we represent in this earth and speak up. Telling the world about Jesus. Doing the exploits that we are called to do in this earth. It's time, right? It's time. Let's rise up, church. Let's be that church that we are called to be influencing our atmosphere, not being influenced by this dark world, but being the light that is casting out the darkness around us. Amen? Y'all know I love you. I want to see victory in every area of every life here I want to see this church impacting its community. And we can do it with what we have right here. 
right here. But I want to see that. I don't want to, like we said months and months ago, play church anymore. I want to truly make an impact in this world. And, and for each one of us, that, that, that looks different. That looks different for each one of us. You don't have to impact this world the way I do or the way Gene does or the way Robert does or Dean. You don't have to do the same thing that that person sitting beside you does to impact this world. But you just need to be obedient. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient when He says, you need to do this. You need to go and pray in the common area in front of your sheriff's department. You don't know how many... I mean, it wasn't happenstance that they ran into someone that knew about that. How many more found out about that, and how many more have heard about it and impacted their life? You don't know. So that's why you have to continually put the effort in. Like I was saying before, it takes effort. It takes time. Unplug. Get with God. Let Him show you. Yes. You know, when you get up in the morning, if you'll ask the Lord, Lord, let me be a blessing to somebody today, He'll do it. Because He needs us. Yes. We're His hands, we're His feet, we're His voice in the earth. So if you just say, Lord, let me be a blessing to somebody today, I tell you what, He will take you at your word. <laughs> and I think some of us don't say that for that very reason. I think we know that He will take us at His own word. I, I think people get in fear about that, you know? Do you, would you, does that? Yeah, and and also, well, I'll tell this on myself. Last month, it was the day after Thanksgiving, and and I prayed that that, that morning when I got up, and an, a relative of, our, of ours called, and I spent a lot of the day taking her around trying to find a a doctor that was open and I, and I got to thinking you know I really don't want to do this and something inside and I'm not sure it might have been the Holy Ghost said don't you dare complain about this you asked for it <laughs> <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's right if you ask for it <laughs> you better be prepared <laughs> Because listen, he will open the doors, but he can't. I don't think he's going to shove you through them. You know, we, we you've heard that often. The, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. He's gentle. He's not going to shove you. He's not going to kick you. He's not going to force you through that door. He may open the door, but you have to walk through it. You have to make the effort. You have to take that step. Right? Are we all going to agree that we're going to Take those steps. When that calendar flips, <laughs> when that season changes, you know, just like that star that Kelvin was talking about, he has set those in the heavens as signs for moeds, times, and seasons. Specific times. And we need to recognize the times that we are in. You know, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. How can you tell the weather by looking at the sky, but you can't discern the times that you're living in? The kingdom? I'm paraphrasing. So let's understand the times that we are in and let's understand the role that the church is here to play and you are the church. Let's not think the church is some third party, some standalone entity that is going to function and do these things. No, you are the church. You, each one of you individually, all of you comprised together, compacted together, the word says. 
are the church. And we need you. The world needs you. The world needs us to show them the way to be the light. To eschew the darkness. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, glory to God. Well, I said I was wrapping up 20 minutes ago. I truly am. But can I pray over you? And then we'll receive the offering. Father, I do. I thank you for everyone under the sound of my voice, whether in this room or over the video. Lord, we pray. I pray. I believe that the word has gone forth today. Not my word, not my voice, but the voice of the Lord is being heard because you've given us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church today, right now. And I pray that faith is rising up in the hearts of those that are hearing this message today. Rising up to make a difference right where they are. They don't have to go to uh, some foreign country to make an impact or a difference. They can do it right where they are. Wherever you've called them, wherever you have called them, whether it's into business or family or ministry or a foreign country, wherever that may be, wherever you've called them and they're obedient to go, they're going to make an impact. And I pray that they do. I pray that they're obedient. They first hear, but then they do. And Lord, I want to see us impact as a church, a unified body, this town, this New River Valley. So I thank you that you have given us ears to hear and we are listening and we're going to meditate on what we hear and we're going to consider it and then we're going to do it. So Father, thank you. Thank you for times like this where we can gather together like-minded believers, be encouraged and edified, but also be equipped to do the work of the ministry. And that work of ministry is just the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling a lost and dying world to our Lord and Savior, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus, to God. So we thank you. And we say, Amen. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity to give today. If you're giving online, you can go to our website, cgcchurch.com, and give there. Or you can text the letters CGC to 73256. I believe is the number. This is a time that we set aside to give. I hope that you all have prepared ahead of time to give from your heart. From your heart. Not out of your abundance, but from your heart. Amen? Ushers. Mm I want to thank those that, that share from time to time. Kevin, I appreciate what you said this morning. Judy, thank you for sharing. I want this place to be where you feel comfortable sharing 